And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is John J. Mathis, transpersonal nurse coach who during his NDE became music, which we're going to talk about and more. John, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here. John, let's start on the day that this all went down and go from there. Okay. Uh, so this was back in 2005. And I was in classes leading up to nursing school, uh, chemistry and advanced uh, uh, A&P, anatomy phys. And I was also playing Mr. Mom. And I also had a part-time job. Uh, so burned the candle at both ends. Ended up getting pneumonia. Ignored it. Um, some would say I was uh, infected with the Y chromosome, uh, which just being stubborn and, and I'll just work my way through it. Rub some dirt in it. You'll be fine. Uh, but uh, ended up getting uh, pneumonia really bad. Uh, they had, it was called whiteout in all five lobes of your lungs. You have two lungs, but they have three lobes on one side and two lobes on the other to leave room for your heart. But I had so much stuff in there that it just reflected white on the x-ray. So they're just like, you need to get to a doctor. And I'm like, well, I'm going to the doctor tomorrow. So it's like, okay, fine. Well, the doctor was my diabetes doctor uh, and not a general practitioner. So there is no you know, x-ray or whatever. But she heard me and she's like, no, there's something going on here. So her husband was an infectious disease doctor. So she called him and said, I've got this patient. Ended up getting directly admitted into the hospital. And of course, me, right, Y chromosome, being stubborn, it's like, well, I'm not going to the hospital without a good breakfast. So instead of going to the hospital, I went home, made myself a nice English breakfast, you know, eggs and bacon and toast and good, strong coffee. Uh, if you ever had coffee at a hospital, it's like someone dipped a brown crayon in water and just kind of stirred it around. Um, but that's where things got fuzzy. Uh, I remember having breakfast. I remember being in the car. And then I remember being in the parking lot looking for a place to park. And then I remember being in the emergency room with a doctor looking very concerned and trying to get me to sign some paperwork. Um, when I finally collapsed, the oxygen saturation of my body was, I think, 64, 65%. And for the non-clinical folks, when you see people with that little plastic hose around their nose, that usually means your oxygen saturation has dropped to about 90%. So for me to be in the 60s, they don't even know why I was conscious. And somehow I managed to drive myself there. So they, uh, they intubated me, um, got me started, and it converted from pneumonia to ARDS, Acquired Respiratory Distress Syndrome. And some folks get this when their airbag deploys too close and it kind of shocks the lungs. Uh, sometimes firefighters get it when they're doing a, uh, a scene that has chemicals in the air. They don't have their respirators on but it's shock to the lungs. And so what the lungs do to try to get rid of whatever that trauma is, is they flood the area with you know healing components of the body, except my lungs were already flooded with mucus. So that's why I just complete respiratory failure. So they hooked me up, but then when the lungs failed, the other organ systems sense that, I don't know if there's a hormone release but that's, that's what is the danger of ARDS, is that when the lungs fail, all the other organs can decide whether to stay or go. So within a few days of my lungs failing, my kidneys failed. Um, I blew up to about 420 pounds. Had third spacing, which is in between your epidural and your dural layer. 
fluid can gather. And sometimes that sweats out as kind of a serosanguinous or a, a, a bloody water look uh, from your sweat glands. And uh, I even had third spacing in my eyeballs. It was, it was pretty bad. And then my heart tried to stop. And the funny thing about that was, is what may have saved me is that I had an undiagnosed birth defect. You basically have two batteries for your heart. You have uh, an AV node and an SA node. And uh, the AV node drives the ventricles at the bottom of the heart. And you need those because that's what keeps you alive. And of that bundle of nerves, I had a smaller little bundle that had never been discovered, and apparently it turned on. And so even though most of my heart had failed, this little node still kept me chugging along at about 16 to 20 beats a minute. So it was right there on the edge, so to speak. And a few days of that, of them constantly hoovering out my lungs uh, and, and giving me a chance, they uh, they finally got me back. And organs start coming back online. And and uh, it was about a 13-day thir coma. And I think it was a 28, 29-day hospital stay. Now... That aspect was different because I had not had my near-death experience, but I had previous experience of being out of body and doing remote viewing. So while I was in that coma state, I was actually above my bed on the ceiling, watching people come and go, uh, seeing family members come and go. Um, my daughter was joking about uh, painting my toenails and putting my hair in barrettes. So when I did wake up, I would look funny. Uh, I would hear doctors and nurses come in and discuss my condition, that type of thing. Uh, but it wasn't until I was removed from all the machines and I was in a step down unit. And the only thing I had on was supplemental oxygen. I'm lying there in the bed. And I thought, I've read so much about near death experiences and I was so close. I mean, I mean, the next time I'll have to trip over the threshold. You know, and there won't be this maybe. So I was kind of frustrated and it was just like, I wish I would have had one. And then I fell asleep and I had one. And so all the stereotypical things that and your channel is prolific. So I'll just kind of gloss over this. But I went through the tunnel. I saw the bright light. I saw the bright light within the bright light that was an intelligence. Uh, got to meet ancestors. Um Saw some connections, you know, I saw the behind the machine type of connections. Um, tried to stay. Uh, They're like, nope, you're not done yet. And they actually said, you know, here's an option. And I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not going to give up everything I've learned so far. So, yeah, put me back. How much worse can it get? <laughs> and, 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 of course, you know, you know the story there. Um so then a um, someone was delivering laundry into my room and hit my bed and jolted me awake. And in that moment, it was kind of like, can I get back there? You know, it's like when you're having a great dream and you wake up, you're like, oh, can I get back there? And you try to go to sleep real quick and try to catch that train. It was a different situation. It wasn't heaven. It was somewhere out in the four corners area. I'm talking in a Kiva to a medicine man, and we had conversations that were still on par with the conversations that were in heaven, but they're more earth-based questions. You know, what's my what's my job this time, and what do I need to do? And you know, can you throw me some signposts? You know, throw me a bone. You know, uh, and then seven years after that, I had kind of a Satori experience. And I replayed my entire near-death experience in my mind, but it's like getting the Encyclopedia Britannica and realizing there were like three chapters missing or three books missing. And so I've got the director's cut. So that's kind of it in a very large nutshell. Uh, but yeah, so that was that was my NDE experience.
You said that you had some behind the machine connections.、Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that?、Uh, so there, there is a. So now I back up a little bit. So I had my near death experience in 2005. In 2011, I reached out to Ions and said, you know, hi, I'm a clinical data manager、uh, and a nurse. Can I help you with some research? And so they handed me about 200 case studies. And so I built a database out of those case studies, and for me it was a proof of sanity because I thought maybe I'd broken my brain.、Um, but when I saw that there was a cohort of people, and we had so many things in common, that I was like, okay, whatever this is, at least I'm not a a, a a Venn diagram of one. And that's where it all started. So I did research for them from eleven, twelve. Started a group in in Raleigh in twelve, and then、uh, went to assist in fifteen. But in that process, it seems like we all have a hierarchical structure of how things work and how everything is connected. And a lot of people using computers, they'll refer like to the file folder tree about you know there's this connection, and then within that there's others and whatever. I saw it more like a tag cloud.、Uh, if you're into technology, or if you're not, it's more like a three-dimensional snowflake. In that there is a center axis, where there may be two, three, or four points, but coming off of that, then it's almost like fractals, and it just keeps expanding the further you get out. And in my experience, I landed in the middle of that fractal, and that axis point, that axis mundi, if you will. And started exploring. It was like, "Oh, what's down this pathway?" And it was my grandpa. And I didn't see him, but I felt his energy and recognized him immediately. And when I realized, "Oh, this is what's going on," then it was just like a puppy. And I'm running all over and checking out the fractals, and I'm seeing, you know, you know, ancestors and and uh, uh, pets, uh, former patients that I'd really connected to. And it kept running around until finally I was like, "I see what you're trying to tell me. Everything's connected." And in the back of my mind, I hear, "He gets it! Yay!" <laughs> I'm like, "Okay, so I passed that test. Now what?"、Uh, so it was it was a continuation of you're connected to your family, and then your extended family, and then all the connections you've ever made, and then even the things like. Things I had said or had had written, and ended up like I wrote a book a long time ago, and it it ended up in the hands of somebody in India who read it and was like, "Oh wow, that's pretty cool." And so, if you keep extending out this snowflake or this crystalline structure, you realize you you're connected to everyone and everything, and you don't have to bring Kevin Bacon into it. So, but you can. <laughs> <laughs> was it a download, or how did you discover the lost books of your NDE? So my my mom passed away in 2011, and so I went down there because、uh, I was living in Chicago, and she was、uh, down in、uh, Sarasota, Florida. So I moved down there.、Um, she had been a hoarder, so it was、uh, quite a task to kind of reset and redo. And I did some remodeling and some drywall work and yada yada. Finally got it, you know, up and running. And I was just to the point of okay, I'm ready to put it on the market and、uh, you know move on with my life. There had been a terrible drought that summer, and it was in that twilight time, like maybe four thirty, five o'clock, where the sun the sun was just starting to show. It's light, but the sun itself hadn't crested. But it was raining, and my first thought of like kind of waking up is I see my dad in the bedroom doorframe, and he's kind of leaning against the doorframe, and he's kind of like looking around and checking it out, and he looks over and he goes, "You did a good job, JB," which was my nickname for my dad for John Boy. Uh, but did a good job, JB. And I'm like, oh, that's great. I appreciate that. Appreciate that, Dad. 
Um, the next thing was I was hearing singing. And the closest thing I could bring to it in in, in earth terms would be um, like Enya style music, where just multiple layers and harmonies uh, always shifting and changing. Um, or like a jazz uh, concert where someone has a riff and then they hand it off to the next person and they take the riff, but then, you know, they invert it and twist it and, you know, augment or whatever, but, you know, they do their thing and then they hand it off to someone else. It was, it was something akin to that. But I'm listening to all this music and I'm just like, oh my God, I got to follow this. Well, in my original NDE, uh, George Carlin was my Sherpa. And it was, here's the magic behind the scenes. Here's the audience that I want you to meet. Then after I met the audience, it was like, can I stay? And he was like, well, you can, but you're going to lose the traction. And in my mind, I saw the game Shoots and Ladders where your life is just this constant, you know, up and down, but you're always trending up. And if I came back, which is fine, but I'd have to start back down at square one again, literally. And I'm like, nah, I've worked too hard in 40 years to get where I am. So I'll go back. And then I came back. But in the director's cut that I got later, it was you know, you can stay or go, and here's the shoots and ladders, and I'm like, nah, I, I, I think I'll, I'll go back. Then the next thing was, is I'm hearing the music. I'm like, ooh, where's that coming from? And it was up above me, and so I, I rise up into that, because it's like, ooh, what is this? And you're not limited by your physical, corporeal self anymore, so I'm around these folks, and some of them look like people, some of them look like angels, some of them just look like opalescent uh, boogie boards uh, and surfboards. They're just ovals of light and energy. But it, it was the same type of thing where just as a musician, you were just taking a vibe and, and playing with it and twisting it around and people were joining in and coming back out. Um, circle songs from Bobby McFerrin, if you've ever listened to that, very akin to that. And so it was just this, conversation and a painting with music and i noticed that the more and more i got into it the less human i became and i saw myself becoming that surfboard of light and i didn't care the music was just rapturous and then all of a sudden i feel a tug in the back of my shirt and I'm getting horse collared and I'm being yanked back. Uh, and that's where uh, uh, I turn around. I'm back with George and I turn around to see who grabbed me. And there's Archangel Michael. And he puts one hand on my shoulder, the other hand on my shoulder. And he leans in. He goes, you belong to us now. And my response was that from Caddyshack with Bill Murray. And I'm like, yeah, so I got that going for me, so that'll be good. Uh, so yeah, but yeah, Archangel Michael's been with me uh, in in outside of the normal timeline, but that could be a story unto itself. After either your initial NDE or when you found out more about it years later, did you get any gifts that could be considered to be psychic? Uh huh. <laughs> So that's where my story is a little funky. Um, I started seeing uh, spirits when I was nine. Uh, my grandfather who passed was the first one to show up. Then at uh, 12, I had my first out-of-body experience. At 14, I discovered uh, Journeys Out of the Body by Robert Monroe, and I just kind of read it like an instruction manual. So I already had some metaphysical things going on before the near-death experience. Um, so those got tweaked up a bit. The, the thing that I think is uh, 
when I tell my story, people have found it interesting about what they call sliders or SLI, uh, streetlight interruption. Uh, but sliders is basically referring to people that their electromagnetic field is, is so charged or different that you can walk under a streetlight and turn it on. Uh, so for a few months, I had that going on. So if there was like one of those overhead you know, UV lights that has a, uh, a ballast, like sometimes you can see them like flicker, uh, like they're being energized from Star Trek or something. I would I would do that if I stood under those lights for a little bit. Um, the other thing too is that when I was doing Reiki, um, I would I would I would sweat so badly that it looked like I just took a shirt right out of the washer and put it on. Uh, so there was there was a lot of a lot of energy the first I would say three or four months afterward. Is it possible that at the age of nine, when this all started happening, you had some other spiritually transformative event that opened the door for you? It's possible, but I, I don't know. Um, so the story I got from my parents, and my mom was 19 when I was born, and dad was 23, um, and mom had the high school diploma. So... Getting medical descriptions from them was pretty thin. But what I was told was I had a very high fever when I was born. There was something wrong with my blood. And that the doctors wanted to do a complete blood transfusion. And my dad said, no, he's going to be a fighter or he's not. So they ended up putting me into an incubator. And I was in an incubator for about a month um, before I was able to be strong enough to come home. So I don't know if that situation qualifies, but I also know that a lot of times psychic things turn on when it's a very emotional experience. And my grandfather was he is my babysitter, basically, because uh, my parents weren't expecting to have a kid. Uh, so when I came along, I was a surprise. Well, both my parents are working, so I would literally be scooped up out of bed, still asleep, and I'd wake up at the grandparents' house and be with Grandpa all day. Uh, so he he was my best friend. And so when he died, uh, it was gutty. Uh, so much so that I, I told my parents I wasn't going to pray to God anymore. You know, my nighttime prayers, like a good Catholic boy, uh, I was going to pray to God anymore because God was mean. He took away my best friend. So the only thing I could think of as a nine-year-old boy is, well, you took something from me, I'll take something from you. And uh, that's when, yeah, that's when Grandpa showed up. Would you say that you made more life changes after rediscovering the NDE or after the initial one? After the initial one, I so about 10 million people a year, according to a Pew Research, uh, and I don't know the year on the Pew Research, about 10 million people a year have an NDE. Based on the research that I've done, about half the folks come back, they're wired for sound. They know exactly what they need to do and they hit the ground running. I was part of the cohort of, I don't know whether to scratch my watch or wind my ass. Uh, I thought I'd broken my brain, uh, gone crazy, whatever. Uh, no idea what to do. And I found out later that I was having all the symptoms of PTSD. I ended up basically becoming my own um, witness relocation program. Uh, I divorced. I moved to a new uh, time zone, uh, changed my religion, changed my job, and completely stopped with my materialistic pursuits. After the reboot, I would say I probably ended up being more focused and more holistic. Uh, in the sense that immediately after the NDE, I still had that same kind of file structure. 
here's my Reiki folder. Here's my past life folder. Here's my near death folder. And instead, then it converted to the uh, cloud structure, the crystalline structure, in the sense that all of that gets put into just one big silo. And so you can access a little bit of Reiki, a little bit of past lives. And the way I reflected that was once I discovered past lives is that I would remote view a past life, administer Reiki to that life as they were making their transition kind of ease them through it and then come back. That process began after the the director's cut. Well, at some point in your life, you became a transpersonal nurse. What is that? Uh, that's a good question. A lot of people ask me that. Uh, so you've got a coach. I think everyone pretty much understands what a coach does. I've got the nurse overlay. so. I'm typically helping people with, you've got a new diagnosis they didn't completely understand, or you've got a diagnosis that is a new normal. And uh, folks, I got a new normal diagnosis at my NDE. I had some uh, tearing of my lung. And so they said that I would never be able to sing again. i had been singing since I was six. I've been singing opera since I was 17. So there was no way that I was going to not sing. And it took me about seven years to find a way around it. But I did. It's still not the way it was, but I still have it. And so I, I utilized that experience as well as I seen some things in Western medicine that couldn't be explained. And I want to be that ear for those folks who have those experiences which typically fall into the transpersonal realm like i died and i came back or i had a spiritually transformative experience uh kind of near death without the messy death part um so i, I try to work in those areas of those 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 liminal areas that don't quite spirituality doesn't quite cover all of it nor does psychology cover quite all of it so i work in that space kind of in between so are you assisting people more in processing their NDEs or how to manage their new health situation, like you said, where you had this torn lung? Uh, it's about 60-40, where 60% 60 is more like traditional healthcare type of things. I've, I've, I've got this new diagnosis I don't know what to do with, or um, kind of like being a case manager outside of the hospital. You know, finding them resources and finding them ways to kind of help mitigate whatever's going on. But I do have a few folks that um, I have. I have one person that just popped in my mind. So they started with the um, Monroe Institute, uh, doing some of the the, the uh, classes to, with the Hemisync, and in that process, they started uh, remote viewing spontaneously and they're like oh my god what do i do with this so i'm working with that person with totally fine totally normal uh you'll get around to it with the monroe stuff but silva has some stuff uh assist ions they all have some literature on it so i can direct them to some literature if they're in their left brain or i can speak to it from my own experience you know with the right brain now you studied under joe mcmonagle right at the Monroe Institute? I've had some classes from Joe. Uh, so I took a, a, a contract uh, when I was, after my mom passed away and I handled all that stuff, I took a contract uh, for a research position in uh, Durham, North Carolina in 2012. And while I was here, I discovered that there was a building, a place here in town, IONS, and it was the you know home office for the entire International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm like, oh my God, I've done research for you guys. I didn't know you were here in Durham. So I'm going to pop in. I go to pop in, and I realize they're also sharing space with the Ryan Research Center. And I'm like, that rings a bell. And they have a library there. And as I'm musing through the library, I discover books by uh, Hans Holzer. I'm like, this is where I know the Ryan. My ghost research. Okay. 
So it actually was a, a synergistic kind of discovery in, in finding ions in the Rhine at the same place. In being a transpersonal nurse, are there certain patterns that you find with people who are having trouble processing their NDEs? And if so, what are they? The most common thing has been just having someone to listen without judgment. Um, and it's kind of like in a remote viewing where they teach you, you know, when I, when I want you to look at a fire truck, I'm not going to say, look at the fire truck. I'm going to say, look at the target object and then tell me everything you smell, everything you see, everything you hear. Don't tell me what it is because the brain has been conditioned to solve the problem. And once it solves the problem, it stops. Same thing, I think, too, with the ear, indie ears, is that I don't want you to solve the problem. I just want you to listen. See what I have to say. And have no judgment. That, I think, is the most common. The next thing is just the PTSD that follows and the shock to the senses. Uh, one of my case studies was um, a stay-at-home mom who was Pentecostal in her upbringing. And after her near-death experience, she was extremely psychic. And psychic and Pentecostal don't blend. And so she ended up having to do a complete, you know, control all delete on her life as well. So helping people through the logistics of that, letting them know that it's okay, letting them know that um, it is part of a process, that there are other folks that have been through this, just knowing that you're not alone and you're not crazy is 80% of it. That's fascinating that just having that information helps people. Like you said, knowing that you're not the only one and that you're not crazy. Any kind of affirmation, any kind of grounding, uh, because you've been untethered for so long in some cases. And the the internet is not exactly the uh, arbiter of truth. Um, I saw the same thing too when I was doing PTSD research. Uh, I started with the most common thing. I started with veterans. and. Veterans will only talk to other veterans most often because they don't have to relive the experience. They have to re-explain the situation that brought them to this. Um, you can just, you know, my buddy got shot by whatever. And that other person, I have a common knowledge, I have a common experience. Okay, and? And you move on. Whereas if I have to explain and re-traumatize myself every time I re-explain it, you just stopped explaining it. You stopped trying. And so that's where I thought the value would be with the near-death experiencers and the STEers is that you don't have to go through it. There is there's an aspect of the near-death experience called ineffability, the inability to explain what happened. So having someone already has that knowledge base and has been through the process for almost a decade, I think it brings, uh, it brings comfort and brings solace. What part of the NDE do you think most people have trouble with? Breaking down of a pillar of support. And whatever that pillar may be, um, if your pillar was your job, or your religion. Um, anytime you have a pillar that supported you up until that point, and then when you come to them with this new self, this new operating system, then you find that they don't serve you. Where they previously um, didn't judge you, now they do. When they previously accepted you, now they don't. And having those support systems pulled out from under you, whatever that support system is, is I think the most traumatic. 
What about events within the NDE itself, like re-entering the body or encountering beings? Again, it really depends upon the belief system going into it. Uh, I I think, you know, for example, if you were a uh, an atheist or a Pentecostal and, you know, you didn't see Charlton Heston as Moses and you didn't see angels with, you know, golden halos, um, Again, that that shock to the system of what you think it is and what you were presented with is where there's that that uh, greatest amount of change and, and a challenge to someone, which is kind of paradoxical because in near death experiences you have that event where it is kind of formulaic. But the people you see, it's almost like they, you know, pre-programmed your brain. They went or they they went through the programming in your brain to find out what do we need to show this person that offers the least amount of dissonance so that they will get the message. And in that process, you would think it would line up. Again, I don't want to shock the system. I want to teach you something so you can go back and do that. So you would think a Pentecostal might see Jesus, but Jesus is like, okay, look, here's what's really going on. And for them to not have that, there's where I think, again, that shift between what was and what is, is what causes the the, the problem, that dissonance. Do you think ever since we've improved the way to bring people back and resuscitate people, there has been a lot more NDEs? Yeah, that's getting kind of close to a mental chew toy that I have. Um, it's a thought I kind of chew on and then toss aside uh, to chew on it later. Um, I think we are able to bring more people back than before. I think we're also capable of sustaining people in that space between consciousness and unconsciousness so in that you know liminal space in between um where a lot of the the past life regressionists talk about being in that in-between space uh people who talk about uh, interdimensional beings are also in that in-between space so we actually may be creating instances where the nde is more possible or happens with more frequency because we can keep people in that space. Then I also think also because the acceptance, the, you know, God bless, you know, uh, Ray Moody for starting this process. But when I was at the IONS conference in DC um, in September, it was amazing the colleges and the research and, and the books and movies the accept the acceptance of it it's it's entering more and more into the the public zeitgeist and with that becomes more acceptable and with that becomes more people willing to report it so i think we have multiple vectors going on as far as the rise of that but yeah short term answer yes i think the technology is allowing more to occur for the people that are new and they haven't heard my videos or seen my videos with ASSIST members, can you share a little bit about what ASSIST does and what you learned from them? Sure. Uh, so in 2011, 2013, in that area, I was in IONS. And IONS has changed a bit, but at that point in time, they were more focused on the research um, peer-reviewed work, they were more, you know, to make it simple, they were more left brain in their approach to the near-death paradigm. Assist came along, and assist was more of an experiential type of situation where we're going to address the person, we're going to address the symptoms. And as a nurse, that appealed to me. And I'd also satisfied my left brain having done that research and building the database. So once the logic part of my brain was like, okay, you haven't broke your brain, you're not going crazy, you're having an exceptional human experience. And there are others out there, 
you're just part of a unique tribe, keep moving. So when I discovered ASSIST, uh, American Center for the uh, Integration for Spiritually Transformative Experiences, if I remember correctly. Um, so they had, a, they had a, a thing where you could become a peer counselor. And again, with my nursing background and having worked with PTSD, I was able to kind of fall into to that, that category. After that, that's when I started, you know, going out with people that would meet through IONS or people I'd meet online and kind of start my process of nurse coaching, which later would become transpersonal nurse coaching. But the difference is, I would say, IONS has changed since 2011. They're a little more holistic. But the... The basic difference, I would say, is one is more left brain and one is more right brain. One is more trying to prove the, the concept. The other is taking care of the person who is trying to manage this. I haven't had a guest on from the Silva Method. So can you talk a little bit about that and how it helped you? Sure. Uh, so Silva, I did Silva Method in uh, 2002. Um. So at that point, I hadn't had my near-death experience. I had I'd had my uh, ghost paranormal thing going on. I had remote viewing going on. I had um, four of my past lives I had uncovered. And again, I was doing this all by file folder method. And it was still kind of messy, still kind of a hodgepodge. But when I took the Silva method, they had a very good structure, at least for me in the sense of, you know, this is gonna be a process for just your overall health. This is gonna be a process for doing um, intuitive medical readings. Uh, this is gonna be one for you to change aspects of your life and improve the quality of your mind and recall. So they were very structured with taking the whole kind of metaphysical milieu that's out there, giving it some structure, which is what I needed at that point in my life. It was kind of ironical to have one system come along to build the structure, and then years later have another experience that broke it apart. But that was the process of, of me learning. The The one thing I, I, I really liked about Silva was it taught me how to do targeting with remote viewing. With remote viewing, I was doing things like checking out my grandparents, uh, going and visiting friends and family, uh, you know, kind of benign type things. With Silva, it was like, if you lose something, go into that thing. Okay. So one day I'm supposed to be traveling. I couldn't find my passport. So I'm like, okay, well, let me try this Silva stuff. Uh, so I remote viewed to my passport and became my passport. And then I felt all these physical things. You know, it's cold, it's dark, it's compressed. Um, and it's February in New Jersey. So the only place that was cold and dark was the garage. So I'm out looking through the garage and I can't find it and, and you know, getting frustrated. Go back into the house and it's like, okay, come on, I need more. And again, still feel cold, still feel compressed. Is that this time I see ladies gloves like from the 30s and 40s, the real long, like up to the elbow type gloves. I'm like, why are you showing me women's gloves? And it was like, uh, glove compartment. So yeah, I went back out to the cold, dark garage and opened up the glove compartment and I flipped through it, but I pulled everything out and sandwiched in between, you know, a couple of bills and whatever was the passport. So Silva helped me take some of the metaphysical stuff and make it more practical. And that I think is kind of the basis of Silva because Jose Silva was talking about, he would put his children into a hypnotic state and he would read the homework to them so that they would incorporate that knowledge. But what freaked him out was he would go find the question he wanted to ask and then they would give him the answer before he would ask the question. And he was like, what is going on here? So that's where that whole process began. And then he started with some ideas and then later met uh, Dr. George DeSaw, who was a psychologist uh, or psychiatrist who 
basically put together the protocol and put the, the scientific rigor behind the discoveries that Jose was making. Can you share with us some more anecdotes of what you did with Archangel Michael? Yeah. Um, so again, the timeline is messed up. I, I got my Reiki master attunement in 2009. And I was told by the, the two masters present, I got attuned by two masters, long story. And both of them were spiritualists. But in my Reiki master attunement, they both said Archangel Michael was there. All I felt was a pressure shift in the room. It was like being in an empty elevator versus being in an elevator that's packed. But, you know, I opened my eyes. It's just still two people and, you know, and I'm, you know, on a, you know, massage table. So, but that feeling was what was going on. Then it was probably 2012. Um, I'm asleep, but in my dream, I hear my doorbell ring. I get up, go answer the door. It's Archangel Michael. And he's wearing a karate gi outfit, you know, the loose white pants and the, the white kind of top and the belt uh, and Birkenstock sandals. And so he comes in, sits down on my couch, and we talk about a, um, a Reiki project that I was working on and kind of cautioning me about what I was doing. Then that began a process of maybe two or three times a year. He shows up, and now when he shows up, he's sitting on my couch, and he already has one of my beers out of the fridge. And um, it's almost like the movie Michael. Let me sitting there drinking a beer. And I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but let me stop you for one second. When you're saying he's showing up, I mean, he's like in physical form with you in your house? Yep. yep. Wow. What, did, did, what does he look like besides the clothes that he's wearing? Like, is he blonde-haired, brown-eyed? Um, I think he just shows up however I expect him to see. Um. I, I see a person that is kind of a, a Greek looking person with that kind of profile. Um, he's got uh, dark hair, um, but it's about shoulder length, a um, little olive complected, and he's pretty buff. Uh, he's 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 swole. <laughs> Would you say that he is translucent or transparent, ghost like or physical? Nope, just physical, just as you and me. Mm. Now there have been there have been a couple of situations where I I bit off more than I can chew, and he had to come basically intervene, and he's a different he's a different thing entirely. Um, it's more like a a, a toga and a bandolero type of thing with uh, glowing crystals on it. Uh, a flaming sword, uh, massive wings, and he's pissed. He's he's got the he's got that sacred rage that uh, he's he's here to uh, clean house. Do you think that his name really is Archangel Michael, or he's just some multi-dimensional being, and that's the kind of you know name that we give him? So that's one of the chew toys that that's the same chew toy that I've been gnawing on. So I'll, I'll bring it up because it, it, uh, it creates a lot of conversation. We'll put it that way. Uh, so when I started my PTSD research and it's like in the ears have something, I know soldiers have PTSD. So let's match up the symptoms and see if the treatment protocol for one would serve the other. And it did. And I'm like, okay, well, that's just one group. So let me go find another group. Uh, so I had a friend of mine that is uh, a SANE uh, nurse. And SANE is an acronym for basically, they are the person that's trained to address a rape victim after that event. Uh, so I asked her about that Venn diagram and those lined up. 
And I thought, okay, where can I find another group? And so the other group I found were UFO abductees. So I applied the same kind of PTSD protocol. It all worked out. But in that process of speaking with the abductees, I started to get the sense of, are these people that we're seeing, that we're attributing Archangel status to, or God, Jesus status to, are they actually extraterrestrial or, or interdimensional beings that are just so evolved and have such an energetic presentation that we don't have the verbs and nouns to explain them? And so we just use the thing that we know. And again, when we're trying to communicate from person to person, we have to have a similar construct, a similar language. So that's when I started thinking, I wonder if NDEs and UFO abductees are the same thing, except NDEers are being abducted energetically, and UFOs uh, abductees are being uh, uh, picked up physically. But again, if you look at the two, they're both being, there's an intervention in the human experiment. They're getting a download of information. And then they come back and there's a dissonance. There's that re-entry turbulence. But once they kind of sort it out, they end up doing something to try to serve mankind or help mankind. There's a very altruistic outcome for most, not all. There's exceptions to every rule. But that's what got my brain churning. It was like, I wonder if it's the, the hidden hand is the same thing. It's just our ability to process is different by individual. And so the perception is different. But what's going on is the same. And that's when I started churning. It was like, you know, I've been doing clinical research for 22 years. And we have these really long-term studies, uh, registry trials, for example. They'll run 10, 20 years. And so it's like, well, if I'm a being outside of time, or if my lifespan is 20, 30,000 years, then humanity could be an experiment. And so, for example, let's say I'm running a 20-year study on a cardiovascular study and nicotine. And I start this study in, you know, 2000. So I've got a cohort of people that are smokers, a cohort of people that are chewing. Okay, I'm going to follow you guys over the next 20 years and see, you know, what diseases you come up with. And if you change your lifestyle, what happens? Well, around 2005, six, maybe somewhere in there, vaping became a thing. Well, now I've got a new delivery system. Now, what do I do? Do I not include them into the research and protect the integrity of that? Or do I allow them in? But then by doing so, I dilute the strength of those two other cohorts. Because you may have some people that are smoking and vaping or chewing and vaping. So it's good to collect all the data, but the strength or the power of each one of those arms is diminished. So how do you how do you tweak with that? Well, some would say rewrite the protocol and allow those people in. But if the Earth as a planet is the protocol, you can't really rewrite it. Well, maybe some could say that you did, you know, Noah's flood or whatever, you know, maybe that was the rewrite uh, on the next iteration of the experiment. But looking, looking, at, looking at that registry trial, one thing you can do is selectively pick people out of that group and tell them, okay, if you're going to vape, then we're going to collect both data on you, but you don't let the whole cohort the whole study body know we're now collecting vaping. Because if they haven't thought about vaping, you don't want them to tell them about it. You want to stay the course. You know, you've been a smoker. I want you to stay a smoker all 20 years just for the cleaner data aspect. 
So that's why I was thinking, again, the hidden hand is selectively picking people out of the whole study, giving them a new download, and dropping them back in so that if you look at the whole body and you introduce a new variable, all the data starts to wobble. And so you can either change the protocol to allow that new arm to straighten it out, or you start selectively dropping in some changes to kind of even out the wobble. Then the two questions to me is, is the wobble intentional and who's the hidden hand? I'm still chewing on those. It may answer the question for some people that how can everybody, well, not everybody, but how can so many people see Archangel Michael? He's just one person. So perhaps it's some ET or multidimensional being that is just misinterpreted as Archangel Michael. And also, did Archangel Michael for you say, hey, I'm Archangel Michael, or did you interpret it that way? Yeah, I, I, I made a joke at a group. It was kind of like uh, Archangel Michael and the other person's Archangel Michael. And it got around to me. It's like, damn, this dude's busy. He's everywhere. Uh, but again, if you're an extra dimensional being in outside time space, you can do that. Then again, this other concept is that if we see something that has a certain energy signature, and again, we're rummaging around in our brain as like, what word can I hook into this concept? That's what comes to mind. And being in America, you know, Judeo-Christian, some Abrahamic tradition, all have an angelic representation. So I can see what the majority of society is going to hook that in and pull that in anyway. Um, it'd be interesting to get data on people outside of Western society. What are the people in Asia seeing? Uh, Central America, South Africa, what are they seeing? Um, but to answer the other part of your question is that I just saw this person and just gave them the name Oh, Michael, because I was seeing, I was seeing this person, again, now that I think about this, the first time I, the first time I saw him was in the karate gi. But again, we're playing with time. And in 2011, 2012, when he's like showing up in my family room, drinking my beer and us, you know, talking about stuff I should and shouldn't be doing. That's when he let me know that he goes, John, I've been with you since 89. I'm like, dude, I didn't know you were even around since 09. He goes, yeah, funny that. And he's just kind of got a lopsided grin on his face. And so I'm like, okay, so you've been with me for a while. Thanks for letting me know. He's like, well, you weren't ready. But, you know, we've we've been helping you out. Now, does that mean I'm under surveillance by an extra dimensional cohort themselves? And whenever they show up, I call them Michael because I don't have any other structure. And Lord knows there's enough other, other uh, angels out there that are probably like, you know, hey, one of my chopped liver, show me some love here. You know, Raphael's over there like filing his nails, like, come on, man. Metatron's over there, like, please don't bother me. I got things to do. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't know what the answer is to that, but it's a lovely chew toy for me to kind of mangle up. And I'm not trying to invalidate people's experiences, but I think this could also apply to seeing Jesus. Absolutely. Again, I think it goes back to that, that situation. It was like the movie Contact, where Ellie finally goes to, you know, through the dimensional portals. And all of a sudden, she's on a beach in Florida, which isn't Florida. And she sees her dad, which isn't her dad. And she's shocked to see her dad. And all of a sudden, she's like, you're not my father. And the being replies in her father's voice, this is the way it's been done for millions of years. We, we show you who you are most comfortable seeing so that you get the message. People who have a Judeo-Christian Abrahamic background, maybe that's why they see what they see. 
I mean, again, in my near-death experience, I saw George Carlin. If I'd sung God or Buddha or Kuan Yin, I would have thought it was food poisoning, you know, because I wouldn't expect to see those people. Uh, in my experience, George Carlin was funny, but I respected him because he was the, like the court jester. He spoke truth to power, but he did it in such a hu humorous uh, and entertaining way that he could get away with it. Uh, and and that's that's kind of how I approach life, too, because I've never enjoyed being lectured, too. But I love having a, a discussion. Well, is it possible that that both George Carlin and Archangel Michael are the same being, just in different appearances? It's possible. I mean, anything's possible. My hesitation is that the energy vibe, the feeling I have when I'm in the presence of those two entities is different. Um, there was one situation where I was speaking with Michael and Michael brought along a friend. And he's like, this is my right hand. This is Joe Fiel. And Joe Fiel is going to be working with you. Okay, never even heard the word Joe Fiel before. And then had to go research. It's like, oh, it turns out there is an angel named Joe Fiel. And oh, he's all about being more lighthearted and being a cut up. That is kind of my vibe. All right, sure. Um, same thing with George. I was talking with George. And that energy had a different kind of feeling or signature or vibration. And then when I when my bed was hit and then I went back to sleep, this time I'm talking to um, right out of Central Casting. I mean, it was an American Indian, probably in his 80s, um, deerskin pants, um, kind of a beaded braided type vest, um, face, God bless him, face like a saddlebag, just rubbery dark brown leather and creases and wrinkles and whatever from you know exposure but he had the same twinkle in his eye had the same kind of lopsided grin and had the same energy as when i was speaking with george so the physical presentation and the circumstances changed but the energy stayed the same so in both situations, there are counterparts where the energy was the same, but the physical representation changed as I changed. Here's a couple experiences I want to get your take on. One of them is a significant number of people in their NDE wind up in a waiting room. Like imagine being at the waiting room like your doctor's office or some other appointment. I find that fascinating. They're, they're in some kind of physical room like that. And while I'm just speaking, and you can comment on the second one, is there are a significant number of people who, after their NDE, start seeing UFOs for which they had never seen before. Which, again, I think goes back yep. to your question, are NDEs and abductees the same thing? You're not throwing me some easy ones here. Come on, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're the transpersonal nurse. I'm trying to get some therapy from you here. <laughs> okay. So I too had the waiting room experience. Mm. And so I went through the tunnel. I'm in the space of white light. In the space of white light, I see the whiter than white dot. And because there's no reference point, I don't know if it's a teeny tiny white dot, you know, five inches from my head, or if it's a planetoid that is a light year away. But I look at it and I'm like, oh, what's that? And in my head, I hear, I'm everything. And I'm like, well, that's cool. And I was like, well, I wonder what you are. And then instantly it's right in front of me and it's all white now. Um, and I'm like, Okay. And then out of this, a little silver thread comes out and just boop, hits me in the forehead. And it was like someone uh, flashing like one of those exam lights in your eyes to check your pupil. It was like, oh, okay. Uh, but what it was, was a data transfer. And it was kind of like, in again, in, in tech world, 
you want to see how fast you're, you're you know hitting the site you ping the site to see is that connection together and how fast can i move things back and forth so i got ping and again it was kind of like oh okay that's what's going on and there was like a partial download but then there was a pause kind of like an assessment is like is is he okay and literally I heard he's ready and it was even more data and this time it was like those old fashioned uh really dating myself here they had these cameras back in the day that had the blue cube that you would put on top or maybe uh the big metal housing that had the bulb in it it was really bright uh so we went for the brightness of a flashlight to that kind of and again i just kind of felt myself kind of go whoa and again it was another data push and then there was a pause and again i heard He's ready. And this this time it was like being hit with a spotlight, just off the chart, like a magnesium fire. And so I think what may be going on in that waiting room is kind of a, a balancing of energies and kind of synchronizing your waves. Uh, because Again, this is just speculation on my part. Looking at music and looking at tones and hitting tuning forks, if you hit a tuning fork and you have another tuning fork that is sympathetic to that frequency and just hold them right next to each other, the one that didn't get hit will start to vibrate because of that sympathetic wave. But if you take two forks that aren't in a sympathetic, then they cancel each other out because of that dissonance. So what may be happening is there's a holding area for your frequency to come up to receive whatever that information exchange is. Uh, I've heard variations of this too, where it literally looks like a doctor's office where you're sitting there waiting. But uh, I was in a room of white and I, 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 maybe I didn't need or didn't require, you know, the doctor's office with the, you know, three-year-old magazines and, and uh, you know, the kitty toys that have never been cleaned and all that sort of fun stuff. But it still is a place where it's like you're on pause. Who knows? Maybe it's it's like they're trying to get the stage ready. I would think it being outside of time and space, they'd already have all that stuff ready for you. I think it's more about you uh, coming up to speed and being ready to receive what it is they're, they're wanting to deliver. Uh, well, the other side of that with the UFOs, do you want me to go into that or do you have a follow-up? Let me, let me comment on that real quick. It makes me wonder what's going on. I mean, what's going on in that room? What are they doing upgrading you? And also, I've, yes. had, I've had one guest say that there was someone in the room like that, maybe even behind a podium that was like an ET directing stuff or taking care of the room. I know you didn't say that, but, but still it makes me wonder, you know, what's going on and on the other side, you know? I, and I've, I've read some literature where people have talked about how the soul is actually being installed into the meat suit. And the soul comes from an extra dimensional place and the meat suit comes from ET. And so that's where they're pairing the two before they drop you into the earth experiment. I have not had that experience nor have I read literature in my 200 case studies that follow that. But again, everyone's experience is unique to them, but there is also a paradigm that we can see you're being plucked, you're being downloaded, and you're being dropped back into the experiment. But it, it, yeah, it does beg the question, who is doing that? But I think it's been going on for a very, very long time. My thoughts on the on why people are seeing UFOs after the NDE is that either something within them fundamentally changes within their energy system where the UFOs can spot them on the ground and or now they just have this ability to see them when most of us don't recognize them or see them. Yeah, there's a... 
there's a gentleman named Chris that I re I recently met. Who, He's he's out there. He's out there publicly. So I I think I can tell the story. Uh, so Chris Bledsoe uh, had a near death experience. Mm -hmm. I've had him on as a guest. Yeah, he said like uh, that's why I was trying to remember. Did I see him on here? Because I've seen him in right, other places. Yeah. Well, he's so that's why I feel like I can talk about this. Yeah, he's had two or maybe three. Yeah, and and he's here in the, in the Carolinas as well. So uh, I I met him at a conference. We got to talking. I had no idea who he was. Uh, I just knew he was a speaker. I had no idea what he was going to speak about. But he had that kind of vibe. He had that kind of energy of, of you know, I, I've had I've had a download. And so that's why I walked up and just started chatting him up. And uh, so, you know, experience or two? He's like, yeah. And I said, uh, did you see George Carlin? He goes, no. Did you see UFOs? And I'm like, no. <laughs> So that's where we kind of started. Uh, but yeah, I definitely brought up my chew toy idea of, I don't know what's what, and it could be both. And he he gave me a little bit of information, but he then pivoted into his book, um, UFO of God. I have not yet read it, but I've been told that it will answer some of my questions. But like any good question, it leads to more questions. I think if you look at ancient astronomy or, or uh, archaeo astronomy, if you look at some of the things that have been left behind that are outliers, if you look at um, forbidden archaeology, Graham Hancock and his work and similar, I think you'll find that there have been other iterations of human other than this current iteration. And so I think Earth is kind of a Petri dish where experiments just go on and on and on and on. Well, and I think UFOs are probably keeping tabs on us, especially if we're part of that cohort that have been plucked given a download and then drop back in because anytime you change a variable you want to track that variable really closely to make sure it's doing what it is intended to do well speaking of books you have two of them what are the titles and what are they about uh so yeah i i, I resisted the paradigm that seems like you know the the paradigm is you die you come back you write a book you talk about it and when i came back i was like i'm not going to do that uh, so I did it. It just took me a while to get around to it. Um, but the first book was, I wanted to, so the back, the back backdrop of the book was uh, the towers going down to 9-11. And I had a few chapters here and there. I'd written some stuff here and there. I hadn't really put it in a book form. But when 9-11 happened, it was like, that was such a, negative coefficient in the human experiment that I wanted to do something to kind of mitigate that. So in that process, I thought all of the stuff that I know now, I had to work really hard to find when I was a kid. So maybe I could write a book and introduce this to the young adult reader. So I wrote this book and uh, it was called The Alchemist's Heir, H-E-I-R. And I used the uh, Young Merlin and Arthur template, but it is a grandfather and his grandson. The grandson's being bullied his freshman year in high school and he started to do some destructive things. So his parents say, we're going to send you to live with grandpa this summer, give you a little break. And so grandpa is a Reiki master. Uh, he does remote viewing. Um, he's got um, a very metaphysical, spiritual, holistic bend. And so we're, we're introducing the young adult reader to those concepts. 
if you're a little bit older and have, have experienced some of these things, I mean, one of the things, so he has two dogs. One's dog's name is Kuan Yan, and the other one's name is Siddhartha. Um, so little little nuggets like that. So if you are experienced, it's not going to be dull for you. And hopefully it's one of those books that you'll read it, and then maybe years later you pick it up. Oh, he had this in here too, and I didn't pick that up. I love books like that, so I wanted that. And at the end of the book, I cited all of the books that I used as resources to kind of pull that out. And everything from Diane Stein's to Central Reiki to, um, you know, Carl Jung. But that was the first book. And in between the two, uh, I was experimenting with a, uh, a Reiki-based uh, skin cream for cancer survivors. But once you write your first book, you kind of get a bug. And everything becomes a, a potential story. Well, when I was selling my skin cream at, you know, book fairs and mind, body, spirit expos and those type of events, I noticed that they they tell you that, you know, your your demographic is 35 to 65 year old females with college degrees and disposable income. OK, that's not a, a it's not new. But what I did notice was they typically had a man in tow who looked like a dog going to the vet the second time. You know, just no. <laughs> so they're in their phone, they're reading a book, they're, you know, if there's lounge chairs over in the corner, they're, you know, they're grabbing their chair. And I thought, these guys are the ones we need to get. There's, you know, and if if they're if they're with someone who is in that world. It can't be totally repellent, but so much of the literature and so much of the, of the people who present are female. And so I thought we need someone who does dude speak, who can speak to metaphysics. And that's where I started. And so I ended up writing my next book, which is Guitars, Cigars, and Tiki Bars, A Guy's Guide to Spirituality. and that is basically me day drinking at a tiki bar and another guy shows up and basically we start commiserating and i'm like yeah i had this near-death experience i had all these abilities turn on and it doesn't seem like the world cares the world's caught up in its own comic opera and he's like well tell me one and so that's how the book starts is basically me going through again what is the metaphysical thing what am i doing with it how does it make your life better but it's very much in a dude type of situation and of course we're both day drinking so we both start smoking cigars um at one point in time um my character goes to the bathroom comes back and while he's there he sees a, a machine he's like oh i'll get some gum i probably got some bad breath Buys the gum, goes out, and sits down at the counter, and realizes he didn't buy gum, he bought a condom. So, you know, hilarity ensues. But it I had one person read it, and he said it was like a uh, uh, Wayne Dyer with dick jokes. And it's like, I'll take that. Yeah, I'll take that for sure. And the the one I'm working on now is more of a holistic approach, but it's it's gonna be probably another few months before it comes out. Well, after watching this podcast, people may have questions for you. Are you open to that? And if so, how do they contact you? Yeah, bring it on. Um, so, I mean, that's one of the messages I got while I was over there was, you know, well, why do I need to go back? And again, they're using energy over there. And I try to find the English words. And the English words that came back were spiritual paramedics. So that's that's my reason for being here is to help people through that crisis and let them know that, you know, once you get over any challenge in life, once you come out the other side, you're stronger, you're wiser, and you find it's a tool that you needed to continue your human experience. So that's what I'm here for. 
Uh, they can find me at uh, johnmathis.me. And through there, there's links to books, talks, classes, um, and uh, a calendar if you want to schedule some time to chit chat. I've also got a link to my YouTube videos. I've got about 40 YouTube videos out there too, where I kind of meander through different uh, mental chew toys. Well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? When I first got into the room, it was the equivalent of taking off a baseball cap and hanging it on a hat rack. But that baseball cap was every disappointment, every bad thing, every muscle cramp, broken bone, uh, missed bill, anything that was kind of a negative energy experience was dropped off of me as easy as taking off a baseball cap. And that was the beginning of the realization of that this is just a play. This is just a game. And, you know, your soul has been a human a bunch of times. And you've been exploring different themes for a very long time. And that just to be here on Earth requires a spiritual acumen and dexterity that other souls do not have. When, when, I, when I was over there and George Carlin was like, hey, everybody, this is John. And they go, hi, John. And he says, and John is from Earth. And the whole place goes, ooh. And I'm like, what are you going ooh for? I mean, Earth? This is heaven. What are you doing this about Earth? And immediately I get flooded with, Earth is hard. There's play, there's people here that won't go to Earth. It's the Wild West. And not everyone can get there. And so we're almost we're almost like um um I forget the term for, for TV shows that are engineered, uh, but it's almost it's reality TV. We are reality TV for those souls who won't come here, but they kind of want to lean in and kind of see well, what, what's going on with that place but you have to have acquired a certain spiritual mastery to just to be here and so the positive message i would leave you with is that if you're hearing my voice and you're here you're a spiritual badass and part of the rules for jumping in here is you have to abdicate that knowledge so that you could relearn it again and possibly pick up different things. It's like playing the same video game, but as a different character or at a different difficulty or with a different you know, weapon or tool. You have to abdicate that previous knowledge so you don't have those predisposed ideas and thinking. So you have a clean perspective when you go through. I mean, if you meet somebody from a previous life who killed you and they're supposed to be your best friend in this life, you may have some dissonance there. So you, you need to kind of shed that old knowledge or that front loading of knowledge so you could have a nice clean slate this time. Then when you get over there, you oh, okay, and you put it all together. So right now, don't beat yourself up because this is what you signed up for and you couldn't be here unless you already had the toolkit to do it successfully. John, thank you for your message, and thank you for being my guest. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the Join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.